I'm going to talk a bit about what it means to run your Java service in production. Uh, I'll explain what that means as we go through. So first off, a quick plug. If you haven't seen this tech talk, it is amazing. It is well worth watching. It's all the things that a JVM does that um, basically you would never have thought that they actually had to think about. Um, in particular, this includes things like GC, it includes jitting, it includes um, exception handling, um, various things that they had to make faster because you guys wanted them to be faster. Um, so a quick introduction to who I am. I helped build bits of iPlayer at the BBC, uh, and I helped build a Hadoop cluster which actually processed all the data about who was watching what. Uh, I then in 2012 went to work for Facebook. I worked on the backend storage for Messenger and Facebook's internal monitoring and a bunch of other stuff, which is all HDFS and HBase. Uh, from there, I came back to the UK and I worked for Apple for a bit as part of the um, Apple's Hadoop SRE team. Uh, on another set of big HDFS clusters and HDFS and Yarn and Kafka and things. And I am currently a contractor due to finish shortly. So if any of you want to give me a job after this, then great. Uh, and uh, I'm working on HBase and HDFS. So these HBase, HDFS, they're all Java. And this is where this talk comes from. Um, I've seen HBase and HDFS evolve quite some substantially over time. And so this has kind of driven me to say, yeah, there were some mistakes they made at the beginning. Uh, these are things that you guys can learn from in building your own service. So very roughly, I put together a, few, a small set of work, titles of various things that I consider to be stuff that you need to do to make your service run on production. Um, I'm going to go through these titles one by one. Um, but, you know, these, these are effectively how I see the problem breaking down. So we'll start off with the startup environment, Java command line. Um, I have a nice little picture for you. Um, this talk, the first line was from an album called The Wall. It's a Pink Floyd album, uh, for those of you who don't know it. Um, I chose The Wall because fundamentally we talk about breaking down walls and we talk about throwing stuff over the wall. Um, Dev and Ops traditionally have this whole thing of fighting each other. Um, this talk is really trying to help you not throw stuff over the wall. So hence, you'll see a lot of pictures about walls uh, in here. Um, well, not as many as I wanted, but a few. Um, so let's start with the Java command line. Uh, the Java command line is immensely complicated. I don't know how many people have actually like fiddled with various bits, but it is immensely complicated. The JVM is a very, very complicated bit of software these days. Uh, it has a lot of options. It has a lot of random modules, depending on exactly which version you're using. Um, you can often end up with some very clever bits that you can just do in this version that, that they've just brought out. Um, so roughly, they, they fall into a few groups of options. There are a few more beyond this. There's things like verbose GC, which just doesn't fit anywhere. Um, but very roughly, um, we have the class path, uh, which is basically, I mean, you'll all be familiar with that, I hope. Um, that's basically where you load various classes from and where you try to for um, the, the things that you're going to use. Um, you also have a set of definitions and properties. Um, there are some of these that are used by core Java classes, uh, things that actually load straight in the in the JVM itself. Um, for in terms of production, I've picked out the the Comson JMX remote one. Um, I will talk about JMX in a bit, um, but basically that turns on the JMX management agent, the standard one that comes with the JVM. Um, but you often have other things. So, you know, um, we were just debugging a problem with logback, which is a logging framework. And that ends up using minus D options to tell you what particular file it, you want it to use and so on. Um, they can be used both by your classes, by the JVM, and by other things you might load. Uh, then we have the sort of X options, which are kind of, eh, they're slightly weird options, but they're kind of mostly standard now. They were the extended options originally. Um, they include things like the heap size. That's one you definitely ought to know if you don't know it. 
XMX, that's that's a definite thing. Um, you have an initial size as well, the XMS size. Um, we can also do things like set up the uh, garbage collection logging with the Xlog GC uh, options. Um, then we go further to the really extended options, extended extended options, uh, which are things that are you know specific to this particular JVM. Um, you might have things like I can tune my memory management, I can tune my GC, I can pick which GC I want to use for which spaces. Uh, so yeah, fun stuff there. Um, things like Xlog GC actually has XX options to help it configure itself, especially once you get to things like rolling locks. And then finally, you actually have the software you're going to run. <laughs> I mean, you know, who knew we'd take this long to get to that? Um, obviously, you can run a jar, in which case you'll enter in main, um, or you can specify the, um, the class name itself. Uh, oops. Oh, sorry, no, okay. So, I obviously, as I say, I work with Hadoop. Uh, now, this is actually slightly in the wrong order. Um, in fact, we actually start at the bottom. I, I put it in this order because I couldn't decide whether to say, how, how do we trace through these various shell scripts uh, downwards, or how do we, or what do each of these shell scripts do so that as I get to them, you can actually see what they do. So I decided on the latter. So we have the one bit of actual configuration, which is this Hadoop env dosha. Uh, that's full of basically options that the user has specified. Um, it's, it's a shell script, so, but it mostly just does exports, and that's what it should be doing. Uh, then next, we have the Hadoop config dosha, which its job is to find the Hadoop env dosha on the file system and then invoke it and source it. Um, it also sets up a few bits of class path and some more dash D definitions that Hadoop needs. Then on top of that, we have, before, before we even call Hadoop config share, we, we call HDFS config share. Uh, HDFS config share calls Hadoop config share, <laughs> again, finds it. Uh, and then we start actually getting into the binaries that you use to actually start Hadoop. Uh, bin HDFS, um, that tells you what, um, that, that tells you how to find HDFS config .sha. It sets up a few options and then it also sets up what class we're going to be running so that we can start our HDFS um, data node or our HDFS name node. And then normally what you do is you'd actually run bin Hadoop daemon, but that invokes bin Hadoop, which invokes bin HDFS. So this is, this is roughly how building up a ver and what you end up with is basically six lines, seven lines on a 100 character wide terminal of options to Java. Um, obviously quite complicated. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is something I want you guys to be thinking about when you package your software, you know, like these poor sysadmins that are starting your software, they're going to run just this one bit at the end. And then when it goes wrong, good luck. <laughs> so the bits I didn't tell you, uh, it turns out we can't actually just do Hadoop daemon to start data node. We actually have to start supplying config so it can find out where to find all its various bits. Um, and you know we have to tell it where its Hadoop home is and so on. Um, the actual process signature, it turns out that there's actually a limit in, although the, the past, um, the, 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 the set of arguments that are passed to the process are correct, um, it turns out that actually when you try and do a PS or even if you look in proc for what the command line is, uh, a very, very long command line such as you might get in say HBase, um, you actually can't even find the class that it's going to run, which is normally a kind of good way of identifying what the process is, you know, find the command. Because, but it turns out you can't do that. So Hadoop actually gets around this by making sure that one of the various shell scripts, and I forget which, um, inserts an early like minus D proc Hadoop uh, 
or proc, proc data node or proc name node. Um, the reason for doing this is fairly obvious. It means you can actually identify which of these various Java processes is which. Um, none of those scripts actually dealt with running this as a user. I had to do that myself. So I then had, so if I'm going to start this binary, I actually have to start it, I have to wrap dropping the privilege correctly, sudo or whatever. Um, these services are going to need other bits of environment that we have, so things like stuff you might specify in limits, core dumps, file descriptors, and none of those scripts did any of that work. They just dealt with the command line in the startup environment. And then, yeah, if you want to actually start or stop the cluster with the standard scripts that come, there's a stop DFS script or a start DFS script, and that SSH is around the cluster to then run all of these more scripts. So you've now got yet another layer on top. So the, this is kind of the end of this bit, but this is sort of stuff I want, again, I want you guys to be thinking about because this is part of what it means You've got to start up your service to run it. How do you do that? How do you basically say, we need to construct this in a way that it's traceable? So the same software engineering principles apply to how you would write your code, to how you write out the structure for doing this kind of thing. So we talked about that. So garbage collection. I said I would go through this fairly fast. I'm not going to talk much about garbage collection. We have the world's master of garbage. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, obviously, walls. Donald Trump has been talking a lot about building walls. So, yeah, we don't want him. We want the Pope who's been talking about, yeah, breaking them down. Um, I am not going to say a lot. That video at the beginning with Cliff Click, he talks much better than I ever can about Java about garbage collection in Java. Um, very roughly, it's one of the things that they had to completely reconsider as part of building and improving the JVM. Um, you end up with multiple spaces. I'm assuming most of you probably know some of this. Um, but that, that just those two first points are better dealt with in an entire talk. Um, it turns out GC is incredibly complicated. Um, roughly, though, what, what happens is either you clean up the stale objects uh, uh, or you find active ones, in which case you promote them a level above until you just can't get any longer. Um, you can use different algorithms for different spaces, which allows you to do some cunning things. Um, it turns out some are better at certain things than others. Uh, in particular, I've marked stop the world. Uh, stop the world is a thing that GCs tend to do. Um, they often remap um, some of the pointer links. And so it turns out that they need to do this when no other threads are running. So they actually stop. They take a global lock on all the threads. Um, and this is actually why we care about GC, because it tends to do something like this. Um, and it can make our program stall which, if we're a service, means that we just stop doing any work. Um, and that includes all the monitoring work and everything else. So the various different types of GC that you can choose, they have different properties in terms of how they parallelize, in terms of how much time they spend with the world stopped, if they stop it at all. Um, the, the thing is they, that once you end up with a GC overlapping, then you, you, know, you might ask from that, why do you even, ever choose one that even stops the world at all? The answer is because if they overlap and you don't have enough space, then it will have to stop. Even the ones that don't normally stop the world will actually stop the world under those conditions. Um, again, you know, look up your latest JVM in JDK 1.8. There is all the stuff with G1 GC. That's, very, that's a very newish... Um, garbage collector style. The more traditional ones are the, um, the, the parallel one and the, um, the concurrent mark, mark and sweep. Again, I said I won't say much on that, so logging. So this is, this is actually something I care about a lot. Um, I've seen some awful log lines uh, and really, truly awful. But I don't know quite why I chose this one for, for logging, but I don't know. 
<laughs> but fun. Um, so basically, any of you who aren't using SLF4J for your logging, what the fuck are you doing? Seriously, like this is this is 2016. We should be using this. Um, it's a very simple uh, log facade. It's it basically hides the implementation. It provides a standard interface for for logging, um, and it allows the sysadmin and the operator to really configure what the, what logging engine they want and and so on. Um, the I've sort of said, why would you want to do this? Well, sometimes you have files, sometimes you have things like Logstash or Scribe, if you're completely crazy. Uh, you might even just be sending it to an RSYS log um, somewhere. Um, I've pointed out two of the sort of fairly standard backends. You've got Logback, which is the one that we're using here. And we've got Log4j, which is the one everybody knows. Um, the the idea of SLF4j is basically to supersede the sort of standard stuff in log4j um, because log4j wasn't extendable enough. Um, the log rotation is generally handled by configuration. Uh, there's various different types of uh, rolling file appenders and daily rotating file appenders and so on. Um, they're generally really useful because uh, what they mean is that you won't um, run out of disk space. Um, you, you shouldn't be keeping all logs ever, but at the same time keep enough to actually be able to be usable. So what, what's usable? Well, so we have various different log levels. So various people have asked me over the, when I sort of started talking about doing this talk, they said, well, one of the things I have a problem with is actually knowing when to use which log level. And this is, this is a complicated thing, and a lot of it actually just comes down to experience and a decision made at the time. You know? um, I've tried here to basically say what, what, what sort of states you might be in that might end up using a particular level. Um, some logging systems have things like notice and major and minor and other sorts of things as well. And they sort of fit in and they slot in here, you know, as to quite how major or minor you think it actually is. Um, very roughly, um, I think fatal's pretty obvious. Um, fatal's generally a thing uh, in C. We might have it when we have a when we detect a stack smash. We can't recover from a stack smash even if we can detect it. Um, in Java, uh, I'm not sure what particular state you would, might end up in, but I can see various services ending up in states where they cannot possibly carry on. There is absolutely no way, and the best way to deal with it is just to shoot themselves in the head. Um, error events. Well, generally, errors should really require a human to be looking at them. If, if you're logging something at error, it should be something a human actually cares about. That isn't always true, um, but it mostly should be. Uh, warning events are things which probably don't need a human. Um, in fact, they shouldn't because there are probably way too many of them. But when I come to look at the error, seeing all the warnings that came before it is really, really what I want. Similarly, info events kind of become the kind of key for warnings. They feed into that and debug events are obviously really for tracing. They're for things where you're going, why is this possibly happening? My reading of the code doesn't say this should happen. I can't seem to reproduce it on my machine, but it's happening on live, what the hell? So that's fine. But the, then we come to the actual messages, right? So we have two different audiences for these log messages. And this is actually where people get it really, really wrong. Um, most people do really well at this second one. They do really well at going, right, I know how to log so that I can trace through code that I know really well because I wrote it. And that's great because when I'm in the middle of the night, if I can't work out what's going on, I'm going to call you. You may not like this. So in fact, what you want is actually to do as much to help the operators, to the systems team, to help you. Um, 
the more that you can tell me about the state based on what I actually know about how the program runs, even if I don't know the kind of core detail of your data structures, um, then, you know, tell me why you couldn't read a file. Was it because the permissions were denied? Or was it because the file systems are mounted? Was it because the file system's gone read only and you couldn't write to it anymore? Um, the more you say on that front, the more I can fix the system and help you actually have a running program. And you won't need to be called out. I mean, you know, this is great. This is a great thing for you. Um, however, I will say, I've seen a lot of Java messages that say, I couldn't open a file, permission denied. Okay, what file? Oh, well, I'm not gonna tell you that. That you'll have to work out for yourself. Um, that's no use to anyone, right? If I can't reproduce it and go, yes, okay, I can see that this file is permission denied, then, you know, so, same thing when you're debugging your software. It's exactly the same. So then you get to the point of saying, well, but then, okay, doesn't it start to become a little irrelevant? Well, use your judgment. Yeah, what, what do you think you would need? Um, I tend to apply the 2 a.m. on a bank holiday after I've been drinking on the Sunday, you know, and my phone goes off. Um, that's the test I normally apply for this kind of stuff. If I can't work out what the hell is going on at, at 2 o'clock in the morning when I've just been woken up and I've got a hangover, then good luck. You know, it's, it's not going to happen fixing this stuff. And I'm going to need to get other people online. Um, the other thing about this actually is that um, in terms of actually using the logging, uh, there are times when I will find myself going to the code to say, well, what does this log message actually mean? Under what situations is it actually happening? And if there are lots of things which use the same phrase, say, I couldn't read a file, then, and that occurs like hundreds of thousands of places in the code, then again, I'm not going to be able to find it. So it's really nice if you can actually find ways to um, distinguish your messages. And I've sort of put this whole thing about the formatting. Um, I tend to grep code. Um, I don't know what other people do when, when stuff fails, but um, I tend to apply grep. And that means that if you've line wrapped your nice, uh, easy to search phrase, then I won't find it. And that's infuriating because suddenly I'm having to go, uh, can I try and find this bit of the phrase or that bit? Not helpful. Um, so yeah, join strings and things. Like try and group it. If you've got a phrase that's going to identify that log message, group it on one line. Um, I mentioned before, we have actual, these days, Java, the JVM will actually do garbage collection logging for you. Um, I mentioned that it stops the world. Um, the, the world is a kind of core function of the JVM itself. And so actually it can do its own logging itself, which really helps. Um, that means that the garbage collection does actually come out of the JVM. Um, the Xlog GC, that kind of has all these related command line options. There are tons of them. Um, I, I recommend you go and look at the man pages for them or whatever. Um, verbose GC, tenuring distributions, and so on. Um, the, the newest JVMs, so from uh, 6034, 72, and, and all of JRE8, will actually do its own rotation. Um, the log rotation scheme for the Java GC logs is somewhat crazy. Um, it's implement, I, I, I wrote in a comment recently uh, in some code to process them that um, there's, they're a sort of insane ring buffer. Um, roughly, you end up with as many files as you tell it um, to, to group into um, to, as the maximum number of files, um, and one will be marked as current. And all of the ones round the ring back the other way are old. So, yeah, so you can end up with things like dot four is older than dot three current, um, and uh, yeah, dot zero, dot one, dot two. Fun stuff. So that's logging. Config, uh, that's another big thing that we have on production. Um, obviously, you need to configure your software. Uh, 
that's the album cover um, for the wall. Um, it's obviously the one that uh, we don't need no thought control came from. Um, so there are lots of different types of configuration. Um, I kind of, I remember there being this sort of weird application configuration in Spring, which was all that horrible routing stuff. The stuff you, the developers touch, but the operations never do. So I'm not talking about that. That's all part of your package software. Um, I'm really talking about startup configuration and runtime configuration. Um, we have all sorts of different formats. We have the, the wonderful Java properties format, my favorite. Uh, XML, about as readable. Uh, JSON, which is actually probably the nicest these days. Uh, and then we have various people inventing their own. Um, things like the Apache formats of various sorts. Um, these days, it's really, really, really nice if your configuration is self-reloading. Um, I appreciate that that can't apply to all types of configuration, but the more that you can actually make it into, hey, we can actually do this, we can change this value in real time um, as an operator thing, um, the more, the, the nicer your service is to run in production. Um, because the less you actually have to screw around with stopping and starting it and making sure your load balances are healthy and so on. Um, so I've got a couple of, very, of examples that we see in the HDFS. Um, obviously, I mentioned the shell scripts before. Uh, that's a config. Um, it's totally valid as being a config. It's in shell. That's not an obvious format for config. Uh, we have the, the various site XMLs for anybody who's used to dupe. Um, they're a particularly nasty XML. Uh, they're a configuration um, thing with uh, a bunch of properties um, with a value and a name under each property. So they're not actually that nice to search. Um, they don't tell you much more they don't, they don't do anything nice in terms of schemas. It's not great. Um, in, a, in HDFS, you also have this one for um, the hosts and the hosts excluded. This tells you roughly what you're decommissioning. This is a, this is an, a runtime reloadable config um, and roughly tells you what hosts should be in your cluster, what you should mark, because I don't want to be writing to this anymore um, so that I can take it offline and so on. Um, they're just lists of their lists of servers, um, new, new lines separated, but that is also a config. Um, and I've mentioned also, like we were talking about it earlier, um, Zookeeper, stuff in Zookeeper, which isn't always uh, considered content. Sometimes it's runtime state, um, but sorry, isn't always config, but sometimes it's runtime state, but sometimes it needs initializing. So we can treat it as being kind of similar to config in terms of a config deploy. Um, so, my big one, telemetry. This is something I care a lot about. Um, telemetry is our window into the world. Um, this is obviously not a real window. Um, for those of you who know it, it's um, on the Gaza wall and it's painted by Banksy. Um, but hopefully most of your telemetry won't be as fake as that is. Uh, that would be bad. In general, we'd prefer real stuff. Um, so I mentioned Gemx a couple of times. Um, Gemx is the Java monitoring extensions. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, and it's hateful at the same time. Um, anybody who's actually used it will say it's absolutely horrid. But it is actually really, really cool on a different level as well. Um, it's basically a magic API internal to the JVM. Um, which helps you expose information, which helps you expose kind of telemetry and internal state information. Um, and it comes straight with the JVM. You basically have on, on one side, the code, the developer writes an mBean, uh, that's a monitoring bean, and that can expose, it can alter, it can expose a bunch of function methods on running state. Um, a lot of the frameworks, um, Spring again in particular is the one I actually know a bit about, um, actually let you expose data via annotations, but Spring lets you do everything via annotations, so I'm sure you knew that. Um, on the other side, um, the operator can start up or even insert into a running JVM a management agent. 
And JMX basically ties the end bean to the management agent. So the management agent essentially says, well, I might run a service to allow people to connect to it and expose the data in JMX, or it might spin up, a, it might attach a jetty, or it might do certain other things. Um, you can actually um, get at the management stuff from within your code as well, obviously. So you can, you, it's not just a one-way um, gateway, it's actually a two-way gateway. Um, the management agent itself runs at the same level as the main thread, in much the same way as the GC threads do. Um, so you can actually sort of, in, this is why you can insert it into the running JVM. It, you don't have to sort of find a way to, to create the new thread or join it at the end or anything like that. Um, the most common, the reason that everybody hates JMX is that you use the, the most common form of it is to use the JNDI. And JNDI is this weird Java naming scheme that involves sort of URLs in URLs. Um, and roughly what happens is that the URL in the middle is a description of how to get back um, to the, the thing that's listening to, that's trying to connect to the management agent in the first place. Um, and so it ends up being horribly difficult to forward around because ports never match. Um, and so, yeah. So often, if you're going to do something like JConsole with it, you end up running JConsole on the server and then just forwarding the X connection because it's easier to do that. Um, that's kind of the standard one. That's the one that you get if you insert uh, minus D comps on JMX remote in your startup options. Um, and it listens on a particular port. You can actually specify the port or it will pick one. Um, you can use the attach API to find out how to connect to it as well. Um, and then there's others. Um, Jalokia is another one um, that exposes a, a jetty and exposes um, JMX, exposes JSON on the jetty for, for the JMX data. So, well, that's told us about how we do the metric. So what makes a good metric, right? Now, this is really complicated stuff because it turns out that there are lots of ways of getting this wrong. Um, so firstly, a good metric should tell you something about the state of the system. So, okay, you know, like an easy one, how much memory are we using? Very easy, nice and easy. Um, how much time have we spent on CPU? Also very easy. Ideally, we want it to be combinable. Oh, where's my point? Um, ideally, we want it to be combinable with other metrics. Um, in general, if I'm looking at a cluster of 700 machines, I cannot look at each of 700 machines individually. Um, I have to start using statistical methods. Um, generally, distribution descriptions, so percentiles and medians and, and uh, means and so on, modal averages. Um, and ideally, the metric on its own means something specific. You know, it's all very well being something that's measurable. It might even tell you something about the state of the system, but it might be a state that is essentially meaningless. Why do I care, for example, about knowing about how, how much memory I started off with? Because I probably set that on the command line on one of those many dash X options, XMS, as I said. Um, so I, I honestly don't care about something like that. Um, most metrics fall into two categories. Not all of them do, but the vast majority. Um, we talk about this often in terms of a car. Um, a gauge is very easy. Uh, it's like a dipstick. You dip your dipstick in the oil tank, and there's a line beyond which there's no oil, and there's a line beyond which there's oil. And you can very easily tell, and generally there's two notches to tell you whether you're too high or too low. Um, the, the idea of a gauge is that it's a simple, like, I've got this variable, what's the current value of that variable? And then we have a counter. So a counter, I, a counter doesn't actually have to be an integer. I know I, I sort of used a counter, and most of the time it is the number of times something has happened, but it doesn't have to be. 
um, it can be non-integer um, and that's useful as well. Um, often a good example is kilobytes per second. I actually write things in bytes, so kilobytes per second is non-integer. Um, now, obviously, hopefully, many of you have used the Unix system. I'm going to tell you a bit about actually how some metrics on the, the Linux kernel has a wonderful set of metrics. Um, it's very, very powerful. But some of them are non-obvious as to how they're calculated. Um, now, quick show of hands, how many people here know how load average is calculated? <laughs> okay, one, maybe two, three. All right. Oh, is there another one that I do? So four or five people in a room of a fair few. Okay. Um, so load average is this number that basically tells you how heavily used a Unix system is. Um, it comes out of the scheduler. So the scheduler ticks 100 times a second, um, 100 hertz counter. And every one of those 100, sec every one of those 100 times a second, um, it basically recalculates what processes should be on what CPUs. Um, and it looks at what processes were on the CPUs last. Now, in order to do this, it generates something called a run queue. The run queue is basically the list of the processes that are actually able to run. Um, in the load average case, you often also include the list of processes that are not able to run because they're waiting on a fast disk device, um, which is that lovely D state that you might see every so often. Um, the, the scheduler runs and it generates a hell of a lot of variables in doing what it's doing and what we do is every five seconds um, the kernel basically takes a sliding window average of the size of the run queue for the last n minutes uh, we we take three separate sets of samples we take one minute five minutes and 15 minutes obviously you can actually do this entirely in that one ninety thousand um, set of samples um, because the others are all subsets of that one. And what we expose as the numbers for a load average are literally the averages of these, the counts in the run queue over each of these sets of samples as we advance each tick. So this is a really complicated metric, but it's really useful. So it's worth doing. And it's worth doing even though there's actually quite a lot involved in calculation. Uh, similarly, CPU, very simple. I'm assuming people who knew how the load average worked probably know how these work. Uh, what you actually get is the same scheduler tick. Um, you increment a counter for how much, what you've spent the last tick doing or what you're going to spend the next tick doing. It's not quite. Um, and you basically increment these counters per CPU and you increment them glo globally. And then your monitoring system actually has to do a slightly more complicated calculation. So in order to tell the percentage of user time, you actually have to say how much did the user time change versus how much did the total time change in that, in that time period. Now, what this means is that actually I can look at some very different metrics for my percentage user time depending on whether I take my two samples over a second to say, you know, what was it at the peak of this minute or at the top of this minute, um, I could take it over a minute with intervals every second to say what was the peak during this minute, or I can actually take it as an average from the start and end of the minute and say, you know, how did it compare as a longer term average over that minute? So those, the, those are not necessarily combinable together. They tell you three different things about how your CPU was being used. Um, and this, this is going to come into why it's nice to expose the raw data rather than, like the kernel does not expose the data of the percent user. Um, the kernel only exposes the raw data and it lets you do what you want with the, to, to calculate a percentage. Um, similarly, the JVM, obviously, as I say, JMX, actually has the JVM exposing a lot of its own internal state as MBeans. Um, you get things like heap usage, you get the various usages per GC space, you get the time spent on CPU, which you can also get from 
um, the kernel, you can get that out of proc in the kernel. Um, and you can get things like the number of GCs of various types, you can get information about the last GCs and, and things about how many threads and what state they're in. Um, you also get from JMX a huge amount of like random non-metric information, but most of that you probably know anyway, because again, you started it up. So hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so in real world HDFS, um, we have things like file system size, file system usage, and nice easy metric. Uh, we have the last communication age per backend. Um, that's a really useful one, it turns out, in HDFS. Um, it can tell you when things are dying very, very quickly. Um, it can, HDFS knows about how many volumes have failed. In, in general, on an HDFS, um, you probably have lots and lots of disks. Um, the uh, Facebook clusters that I worked on uh, they were 120 machines with generally about 12 disks each. So just to give you an idea. Um, so the number of RPCs processed per RPC type, this allows you to get, like, you, you can then break down, like, how many are, are gets and puts, how many are a different type. Yeah, I, I can slice this and dice this data in lots and lots of ways. This is what I meant at the beginning by combinable metrics. Um, those They're associative, and so you can do you can do those operations either when you do the time derivation or before. Um, the number of files created and deleted ever is, is actually quite a useful metric because it can tell you how many files in, you're creating and deleting a second. Um, but it also helps to see the number of files now, the integration of that um, over all time. Um, they're both actually relatively easy things to keep track of in this case, and they give you different information. Um, Lookups on UGI, that one's bitten me before. When your LDAP's running slow, having information about what's going on is really, really nice. Um, so here's a bunch of things which are bad, what I consider to be bad metrics. So we've got metrics that change state. I've seen a bunch of people do this where, is that mine or is that yours? Oh, really? Okay, well, uh, let me run through. Yes, let me run through this last few. So metrics that change state, uh, obviously really bad because if you do it twice, then not good. Uh, doing the per second calculation, okay, I've kind of talked about that. If you bucket the metrics and then low frequency, then statistically they're not very valid, um, not very useful data. Uh, the last run metrics, they're bad because you might miss a run in between your polling. Uh, and the averages since the beginning of time just basically get worse and worse quality because the asymptotic nature. Uh, very quickly, health checking, that's the end of that section. So health checking, for those of you who don't know, also on the wall. Um, the what, what does healthy mean? Well, we, we're not running out of resources. We're doing the right thing all the time. Uh, we're answering the right questions. Fairly easy. Uh, most of the time you deal with health checking by thresholds in your telemetry, but not always. Um, you can do things like circuit breakers. Circuit breakers give you a way to actually say, um, they, they basically give you a way to say, is this resource working properly and handle it if it isn't. Um, there's a rough pattern for doing that. It's well documented online now that I don't, I don't have the time. Um, you can do real-time checks. Providing real-time views of your health and exposing that as data, that's really useful. Because um, I can look at one thing, but if I can tell what, what the application is seeing, that's even better. Again, if you can provide this by a JMX, great. Um, then I mentioned, I, I'm going to skip over this, cooldown. Um, cooldown is nice if you actually have certain types of applications. Uh, you basically switch on cooldown to handle load. Um, so you switch to easier calculations, which you can cache from your nice, expensive, really highly personalized ones. Um, and then finally, like deployment, uh, quick throw it over the wall. Um, this is a big one. Like, I'm sure you all care about that. It's infuriating when dev doesn't look like live. Um, and then, yeah, there's a bunch of things where actually Maven can do quite a lot of the packaging for you natively. So if you're using Maven, do try and do that. It makes life so much easier if you're shipping around real OS packages. 
Um, and whoop, so yeah, break down the walls. There we go. <laughs>